um, tonight you'll be joined by me and my co-host, Jason <coughs> Boots, so she'll be roaming around, just so you know. <laughs> um, great, so basically tonight on Twitter, if you can actually use these handles to connect with us to have an online conversation, that'd be fantastic. And let's just get started. So, um, can I just ask you <coughs> survey the room so I know who's here tonight? In terms of the um, people who are in digital marketing at the moment, um, for those digital marketers here, have you guys used influencer marketing <coughs> before? Can anyone hear me in the back there? Should I go louder? Yeah. yeah? Okay, great. Well, unfortunately, the mic is either the mic or the sound system, so I have to <laughs> resort to no mic tonight. Um, so, for those who are here tonight, the digital marketers, have anyone heard of influencer marketing before? By show the hand. <coughs> Great, and have anyone tried it before? Okay, there's one there, and two here. So what project have you guys used it for, actually? I'm quite curious. Projects or campaigns in general? Are there any brands here tonight looking to, you know, partner up with influencers? No? Okay. Well, okay, what, what brand are you representing tonight? Are they East India Clothing Company? I see. I mean, it's more on the fashion perspective, isn't it? So, great. Well, we'll definitely touch on some of that as well. Thanks, guys. So, this way, I get to kind of survey the room. I get to think about what type of material can actually make it more relevant to you guys tonight. Um, so, I want to kick off today with a really interesting <coughs> video. And I think it really sets the scene very well in terms of what we're currently seeing, as we were just talking about earlier, the reblogger scene, and um, what kind of YouTube has created in terms of the new type of international superstars. Can anyone hear me in the back there? Is that okay? Volume-wise. Yeah? Great. Okay, let me just get this video started. One second. Morning. Oh, hi. Hey, everyone. Hello. Hey, guys. Morning, guys. Video sharing online has revolutionized the way we connect with each other forever. <laughs> now everybody can share anything and everything with anyone. Let's talk about the G-spot. And it's given birth to a new breed of celebrity. <laughs> By simply turning the camera on themselves, bloggers, video bloggers, have billions of people watching them online. So like you know them even though you haven't met. They're sticking two fingers up to the old media establishment. This is so cool. They sell out stadiums and have fan bases boy bands would kill for. With jet set lifestyles, record-breaking book and DVD sales, they're mixing with Hollywood A-listers and have the ear of the world's most powerful people. This new media landscape has the power to transform lives. But there's also a darker side. That is harassment, violation, assault. I was miserable. Bloggers are now amongst the most influential people on the planet. Did anyone recognize any uh, of the uh, popular YouTubers in there? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Do you guys follow some of these guys, I guess? No? Um, well, basically, in the video, you saw a few of the guys. Um, one of them is called Zoella, as we all know. Um, she kind of started, I think, just a video in her bedroom um, a couple years back and decided to start making videos on makeup tutorials. Uh, from there, you know, then she garnered now probably about 10 plus million followers on her account. And also her boyfriend, Alfie, who is the other one you saw in the video just now, they were both just in uh, Madison Tussauds to unveil their new wax figures uh, alongside A-list celebrities. 
So it just kind of really speaks to the volume of how influential some of these v bloggers are and um, what they actually can reach in terms of audience base. Um, some of the other guys in there saw Samantha Chapman. She's also another um, makeup beauty tutorial type of v blogger, and she now launched the global business called Real Techniques on the back on, on the back of that. So in terms of the influence, you can tell that some of these guys have a combined reach of you know, in the millions of followers, and it's just mental in terms of what they can actually do and through their audiences that potentially you guys can leverage from um, in your feature marketing ca campaigns. And just now to move on to the topic of influence itself, I kind of want to just you guys to take a moment to think about a time in the past <coughs> that you made a purchase decision based on something that you read in you know online, something you watched online, some reviews that you actually read, and perhaps just turn to the person next to you for the next quick um, 30 seconds, a quick discussion to one, introduce yourself. Tonight we're actually here at a networking based event as well. But also two, to really talk about you know a sort of influence that's happened in your life before and how you know that's actually affected your purchase decisions. I'll take it the next uh, 30 seconds. Go for it. perspective that's one of the things that we really do you know take very important in terms of how the reviews are online and the reactions that we actually see when you're watching some of these videos or you know reading reviews of what people think about a certain products or you know things like when you're buying shoes when you're buying a juicer online um, so influence happens really in terms of every single day within our lives and the type of you know it's profound in terms of the way that we trust our friends for their opinions we trust our you know online reviews we trust in all sorts of information coming our way. Um, and it's really, it's really, really important to remember that sometimes the way that we utilize some of these could be really powerful to reach out some of the potential audiences who are interested in what these um, influencers are actually talking about. And essentially, you can then align your brand with what they do um, and then to actually influence their purchase decisions down the line. So I kind of want you to take a little time travel with me here. Back to 2004. Now, this is the time when, if you remember correctly, people would just start tinkering along with their online websites. And, you know, they're kind of learning how to do, use some of these blogging platforms. So, for instance, <laughs> WordPress, Blogger. Um, and people just starting to realize that the power of the internet, really. Um, so this is a time when 2004 is a year where blogging actually became prevalent. And in this photo is actually a demonstration of the fact that anyone with a laptop and an internet connection can actually put their information online. They can start having a voice, right? Now for the first time it's dem democratized across the population for every single person to be able to put in their little bit piece of internet on the, in the world. And then in 2006, which is two years after that, we start seeing Facebook um, being more prevalent because now it's opened up to everyone. Twitter got launched that year, and LinkedIn had about 20 million users by that point. And lastly, YouTube was bought by Google. So that was the YouTube turning point when you start, um, a lot of the time you start seeing these speed bloggers putting their videos online, and people start searching for them and start finding them. 
So um, in terms of social media, that opens a whole new channel for people to be able to share their <coughs> views and thoughts instantaneously. <coughs> and for the first time, brands are being defined by people's opinion of them in the public space. So that was really important as well. Now, I'm going to go on to traditional marketing. Are there any traditional marketers here in the audience, given that it's a digital space? OK, two. Hope that don't touch anyone. Um, <laughs> three. <laughs> so um, from my perspective, to be honest, I still think traditional marketing is still very much useful. Um, it's just that at the current moment, we start, we start to think about how we can supplement the traditional marketing tactics, right? Because digital marketing makes a lot more measurable, a lot more effective in terms of seeing how we can target our audiences. So in terms of traditional marketing, just to give you guys some quick facts, and again, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of you guys probably already realize this as it is, but in 2015 alone, 200 million people from the U.S. actually registered them themselves on the Do Not Call list, and 91% of the email subscribers actually unsubscribed from an email they previously opted into. And people now are study, starting to spend three times more times on blogs, and rather than actually spending it on reading traditional news sources, which is really interesting, I thought. And then lastly, for all the uh, links I actually clicked online, 70% of which are organic, not paid. So just something to keep in mind, really, when it comes to traditional marketing. And another thing about traditional marketing, which might be starting to gain a bit more or less um, prevalence online is the fact of invention of um, ad blockers. So in 2011, we started seeing 30 million users using that. But when it actually reached January 2015, it grew to 181 million, multiple folds, and at an exponential rate as well. So by 2016, I would say that's probably double that by, by this point. Um, and that just makes it really difficult for people who are using banner ads to be able to target people online. Um, a lot of times, as they say nowadays, there's a banner ad blindness, right? When you're looking at online sites, you barely, rarely pay attention to those anymore. And the click-through rates on those have dropped dramatically. So what do we do then? Well, brands have to be remarkable to stand out. Basically, this is a recent ad. I'm not sure there's any vegetarians here in the audience as well. Mm -hmm. This, I think, from a vegetarian perspective, is a little bit uh, offensive, to say the least. So this was in the tube. Did anyone see this in the tube by any, by any chance? No? That one? Okay, yeah. Um, basically, it's an ad done by Gourmet Burger Kitchen, and um, they said, we kill them so you don't have to, from a, a very carnivorous <laughs> perspective. And this got a lot of bad press, actually, in, um, in the papers. However, at the same time, the only way for brands nowadays to send out is actually to sometimes be a bit more offensive, even. I mean, some of you guys maybe remember last summer, there was that ad in the tube about, um, are you beach body ready? Right in the, in the yellow bikini, and again, that got them a lot of free press because because other people were actually tweeting about how offensive this was. Then it got them to stand out, um, and in this case, they knew that their target audience was veget was um, carnivores who actually love burgers. So vegetarians wasn't their target audience. So then they decided to actually strike out, and um, it's not always the optimal way to do it, to be honest. But at the end of the day. If that's the only way to get brands to stand out in traditional marketing methods, there's got to be better ways, right? The other thing is, when it comes to actually billboards, um, as you see here in Philly Circus, fill with them here, the only way you can actually reach them is through a one-way conversation. Um, I can't really interact with a billboard unless they actually have a call to action on them. So let me say, you know, follow us here, or maybe go to this portal to actually get more information. But in the day, when it comes to traditional billboards, this is the only way to actually, you know, reach your audience in a one-way direction. And lastly, as we all know, it's hard to measure, right? So when you have an outdoor billboard, or you have a radio ad, or maybe on um, a magazine print, what you can say is, okay, this many people came to this junction, so we can technically say they've done, you know, this many reaches. And on a magazine, this many readers, maybe on average, read the magazine on a monthly basis, so we can say maybe this, this much people were reached. Um, but in the day, it's hard to really measure what the result of that was, because you weren't there to see them actually read it. Whereas with a digital marketing campaign, as we all know as digital marketers here, um, when you actually, when it comes to measuring it, you can, you can really see the click-through rate, you can see how many impressions were on these, um, and actually really track them afterwards as well. 
so again, that's another thing about traditional marketing that unfortunately just lacks a little bit of the measurement basis. So when it comes to then reaching people's interests online, and especially now with so much more bombarding them from every different angle, how do we actually reach them then? So the way I think about it is, it's one of the most fundamental content marketing principles to actually reach them where they're actually most interested. So instead of interrupting their user journeys online, why don't we start reaching them where they're actually reading and spending the most time on? And this is where influencer marketing comes in. Because when you actually follow an influencer, clearly you're, in, you're actually interested in what they're talking about. They're sharing their passions, right? They're, they're sharing their thoughts. And you're clearly interested in that particular niche to actually read about what they do or you know, watch what they do or just see what they put on Instagram, for instance. Um, so here is just some data on the back of that from e-consultancy. 47% of readers actually consult blogs on a regular basis to get their regular dose of inspirations and to get just you know new things to, to actually catch up on. Um, women, on general, actually consider endorsements and 20% of them actually believe in those from influencers. So for those like beauty products, as we mentioned earlier, uh, fashion, that's a very big area as well. And lastly, th this part really hits me actually. So self conversion actually increased by two to 10%. Um, can anyone see it back there? Two to 10% on sales con conversions when actually influencers have endorsed a product and talk about it in a very authentic way to their audience. So to sum it all up, influencer marketing gives you a chance to reach a much bigger audience. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the likes of Zoella and Alfie, their combined reach is about 14 million followers just on you know, uh, YouTube. On uh, Instagram and all the other channels combined it's even more. So it allows you to align yourself with a brand, right? That's actually really relevant to what they do and to actually reach out to those readers who are interested in what you do as well. Um, and lastly, if they're really engaged with their audiences, most likely they're very convincing. And when it comes to convincing people to buy, they're more likely to take that action to go to your product site and buy your products. So now let's look at some of the examples of how previous brands have done it, um, some successful campaigns, and sometimes maybe not so successful, but at least they have actually tried it themselves. I'm gonna look at a few different ways so one of them is through visual storytelling. And now that's actually really popular with a lot of um, the younger generations online when you start seeing people on Instagram and YouTube um, creating content that are visually compelling. Secondly, <coughs> video content. As we mentioned, you know, video is not gonna go away. And it's one of the biggest areas that you kind of reach out to some of these audiences in a very realistic way as well. And lastly, live events. That's another interesting one to start thinking about um, just because it start involving that person-to-person -person relationship, and um, it's actually very powerful as well. So let's have some visual storytelling. This one uh, was done by Kate Spade. It's called the Saturday Is Campaign. So what they've done is actually they reach out to a lot of Pinterest influencers and to ask them to create a beautifully curated visual board. And th in, in this one, the theme was Saturday Is <laughs> dot, dot, dot. So in this case, uh, the Transatlantic, which is one of the influencers they've used, have done Saturday is your day. And the whole board is an inspiration of things that you enjoy on the weekend, you know, lying in bed, stretching, <coughs> or grabbing a coffee, you know, re reading some papers. And within that board, they've actually have incorporated little dots of Kate Spade's merchandise. So the key thing here is that uh, you don't want to put too much branded material inside, but the key thing is actually to have a few things in there that suggests that Kate Spade is aligned with this particular um, brand inspiration, but at the same time you gain that organic reach as well to the influencers. So overall, re this reached a total of 1.2 million followers, and um, sorry, this should be taken off the account sign, but uh, in terms of the amount of reach on this one, it was very simple, but yet very effective. Does anyone recognize who this is? Hope I didn't give away too much on the uh, handle here. <laughs> anyone? Brooklyn. Brooklyn, yes, that's right. <laughs> that's the son of David and Victoria. Um, so he's now, I think, 16 at the time. So um, recently, Burberry done a campaign called This is Brit. 
and it's launching one of their newest uh, fr fragrances, actually. And for the first time, instead of putting a celebrity, or I guess I mean, he's also an Instagram celebrity as well, in front of the lens, they've actually let him go behind the camera and to actually shoot the campaign for them. And what they've done with the result of that whole day, the whole day event, they've done that. They got some models to share that on Snapchat. So the whole day was recorded on Snapchat and shared with the audience of Burberry about how he's actually shooting his campaign. I mean, clearly he's got a lot of help on the back of that. There were professional photographers behind him to help him set everything up. But then they start using his influence, right? So in this case, he has a total of about 6.3 million followers. And just on this photo alone, there was a 331,000 likes, and you can't really see the amount of comments here, but it was about a thousand plus comments, just about how he actually engaged himself as part of the campaign. Um, another really interesting perspective from this was that for this generation, they care a lot more about being the creator of the actual material rather than actually being in front of it. So a lot of times, in this case, by putting him behind the lens, it was actually more powerful because you're giving him the creative outlet to produce that um, originality content. Um, and at the same time, as guys you know, take control of the campaign, but you can then create it with whichever way is actually more effective to your audience. This one was interesting as well, because Gap, instead of actually doing a campaign through the individual channels of the influencers, they've created a website called Style Defy. So you can actually still see this website today if you want to go check it out after. Um, and on this website, what they've done is done a collection of different influencers doing a style look for uh, featuring one or two of Gap's products. Maximum two, actually. So again, it comes back to the point of authenticity. You don't want to use too much branded content as part of your campaign, but rather you want to soft it in there. So that way you're aligning the influencer <coughs> with the brand, but not too much to the point that's very salesy, if that makes sense. Uh, this one, I'm a... I'm a big travel and food aficionado. If you follow me on Twitter, you'll see what I mean. But um, this one really grabbed my attention because they understood the fundamentality of Instagram. So Cafe Pacific did a campaign called Hashtag Life Well Traveled. And in this case, it sponsored some influencers who are very big on Instagram um, with a very travel-based niche to go on a trip and actually document it along the way with the same hashtag, Life Well Traveled. And these are the moments that they've shared on the portal online, as well as on Instagram, that people can follow along. So in this case, within the first two weeks of the campaign, the Instagram following doubled for Cafe Pacific. And that's really significant because these are all very concentrated audiences that are really interested in travel and are interested in perhaps booking a trip, right? So when they think next of where do I book my trip to so go to Asia <coughs> uh, particularly, they're going to think of Cafe Pacific because they were so aligned with this brand through the influencer that they actually follow it. Look like some video content. Uh, this one was done by Nissan. It's called Hashtag With Dad Super Bowl Campaign. So last year, before Super Bowl, Nissan came up with this great idea that uh, they want to reach out to the families who are watching the games together. And this is obviously, as you know, given that current modern lifestyle, a lot of people really don't have the time to spend with families all the time. They're balancing work and, lo um, and life all the time. So in this case, they had a few of the YouTuber dads, um, they do exist, <laughs> to actually um, create some originality content with the hashtag with dad campaign. So uh, one of them is actually, I'm going to give you a little background before we start watching the video, but one of them is a prankster. He's known for his pranks um, involving his kids as well online. And he's just called his wife to let her know that they're not doing anything at home. Totally unsuspicious. And uh, she's about to come home to a really interesting house full of plastic balls that the kids are just jumping in, playing around. This is right before the Super Bowl as well. So uh, I'll let you have a watch and see what you think. Absolutely nothing. I'm on my way. I didn't find the You're on your way now? Yeah, I'm on my way. How long you got? Uh, 40 minutes. I mean, I just left. Perfect. 
Patrick. We'll see you then. So, um, because this guy is known for his pranks, right, his audience obviously expect that. So what he's done is genius in the way that he aligned Nissan with the prank that he does and made it so original to the point that, you know, his wife didn't know about it and the reaction was just fantastic. So in the first two weeks of this campaign, combined with all the other um, YouTube dads that actually included within the campaign, he generated 22 million views across all the videos in the first two weeks and probably still running through that um, throughout the life of the campaign after that as well. So that was a really interesting one. <laughs> and this next one is done by Royal Caribbean. So they've actually used, I'm not sure you guys, anyone on Periscope using it, trying it? Maybe? A little bit? Um, so they've used Periscope as their platform of choice for this one. They've engaged some of the Periscope influencers where they asked them to create live content so again, with Periscope, some of you guys might know, it's literally live content on the phone, and you can't really edit it as much as you want to, so it's very realistic. And the younger generations, they absolutely love that, because again, it's not really filtered, it's not really processed, exactly what you see is what you get. So in this case, I used some of the Periscope influencers to do that on a seven-day, five-island trip, um, and they follow five influencers along the way. And what they've also done in this case, very interestingly, is they've paired it up with a digital outdoor um, out-of-home display in about, I would say, seven to, to eight different locations in New York City. So people can actually follow not only on Periscope, <coughs> but they can also watch it on digital outdoor displays as well at the same time. So engage a lot of the traditional audiences who are usually following that on an offline basis too. Let's watch some of this. <coughs> Yeah, not only that was a really innovative influencer campaign, but also was using social media exactly the right way as well. So definitely great, great job on that one. Um, and now we look at some live event examples. <coughs> so as you all know, in New York in the summertime, it gets really, really hot. I'm from New York, so um, I know how bad it is. And Hamptons is one of the places that a lot of people escape to for a bit more cooler weather. And Revolve have come up with this really great campaign where Revolve is a clothing brand, for those who don't know. Um, and they created this pop-up shop in the Hamptons where they invited a lot of the lifestyle and fashion um, bloggers as well as influencers on Instagram to come along. And the only thing they need to do is basically wear an item from Revolve and then to be able to tag themselves along for the rest of the day, sharing their fun moments and join the party. So they had like, you know, obviously a lot of Instagrammable type of things such as inflatable swans in the pools. Um, you know, uh, they had like, I think, a big revolve sign floating in the pool somewhere as well behind that. Uh, you can't really see in the corner, but there was a, a life-size chess set as well. So uh, that was a really fun event for them, but at the same time, it aligned themselves with that fun aspect, but also allowed themselves to be exposed to multiple different in Instagrammers accounts and um, using their influence as a result of that as well, given that they're very aligned with fashion. And lastly, this is a beauty um, brand called Sephora. They actually used a one-day event to allow one of their influencers that, uh, I think this lady here, she's a Clinique ambassador, and to let her take over their Sephora Snapchat account and sharing all of her favorite products by using them on herself and showing the reaction that she has on there. Again, very realistic, very in the moment, 
and very much showing the, the, the products from a very, I would say, recommendation perspective, from a friend's perspective, rather than trying to sell it, sell it all the time. So now I'm just going to move on to the four step process of how you should think about influencer marketing and the way that you can actually use it for your campaigns. So the four steps that I would like to usually use is called identify, audience mapping, listen, and engage, and goals and measures. So I'll go over these in a bit more detail in just a second. In terms of identifying, when you have a brand that you're thinking about or perhaps you're working for a brand, um, you want to think about how how do you align yourself? Which type of audience are you looking for, right? So in terms of an influencer, then what particular characteristics are you actually looking for for that influencer? Is it perhaps a good fit in terms of Wings IQ? I mean, if you're doing, let's say, B2B software brand, right? Justin Bieber would be the worst one you could ask for. <laughs> so I'm um, just going to give you some perspective on that. And in terms of reach as well, it's another interesting to, um, to consider. Sometimes having a lot of followers is not always a positive thing. So for someone who has maybe you know six plus million, how many of those people are actually engaged with them on, on a very, um, I guess, personal level? So are they actually utilizing that connection correctly? Um, and then lastly, in terms of call to action, when they actually ask their followers to do something, for instance, you, know, you guys follow me, follow on this link here, or maybe ask them to buy to make a purchase from a product, how likely are they actually to do that? Um, so you can actually see that from the influencer's perspective and just see how influential they are really when it comes to getting call to action to be, to be taken. Next, you want to do some audience mapping. And in this case, to find these audiences, you want to think about where people are actually spending the most time, right? Are they reading this particular blog? Are they um, following this particular account? Um, are they creating really original content. Um, in terms of social media, you want to do some monitoring in the back of that. You want to look through the various different channels and see which one really relates to what your brand does um, and or for your campaign. And other things are to think about where your fans are. So if you have a brand already, that's a really good chance that you already have some raving fans out there. And some of these people, they may not be the most influential in terms of um, their community that they have followers from. However, if they're really believing in your brand already and they're talking about it on social media, they're sharing it with their friends, that's actually a really authentic, smaller influencer to use for your campaigns. And the reason for that is they're already using your products. They, they know what you guys are all about. Um, and a lot of times, a lot of us as friends, right, we believe in word of mouth a lot more than that's if we were to see an advertisement or even more than seeing endorsements from a brand to an influencer. So I would actually say that's a different level of um, actually reaching that authenticity. And next is listen and engage. So in this case, you want to think about reach out to an influencer as a two-way relationship between the two of you. Um, actually think about how you benefit their audience as much as they can benefit your brand. Uh, for a lot of these influencers, they already get reached a lot on a daily basis. And they know that they have a certain type of audience that you're looking to, to tap into. So then you need to think about when you're pitching to them, hopefully um, you guys have done that previously or you haven't yet, I recommend doing on an email format just because when you send out an email detailing exactly what your brand's about, followed with how you can think that you can work together and how you're aligned with what they do, they're more likely to consider that over um, their own time and then come back to you with a proposal that are beneficial to both because they're the one that understand their audience the most and they can often help you to become even more authentic in front of them. Uh, and to constantly think about how you can actually engage them during the campaign. <coughs> so for instance, if they're sharing your content already, they're sharing about your brand, how do you actually feature them or thank them in a certain way when you're sharing them on, on your social channels? Um, and also, lastly, this is the part where I think a lot of you guys might need to think about is how you want to financially reward them as well. Because a lot of times, influencers now, they're a lot more savvier. They know that they, you know, obviously sometimes command a certain type of pay. So it's really to kind of make sure that you're aware of how much they might cost and also, and, you know, negotiate that relatively within reason um, because sometimes some prices can be a bit expensive. So for instance, on some Instagrammers, they might be charging for the likes of, I think, 
10,000, um, 10, 50,000 per post, depending on how engaged they are in terms of their following as well. Um, for the smaller ones, we're looking at more like 10 to 5,000 per post sometimes. So just to keep some of that in mind in terms of your budget as well. And lastly, really, uh, as it comes to any time of kind of digital campaign, goals and measurement is really important at the end of it. So before you start the campaign, think about what is it that you're trying to get the influencer to do. Are you asking them to get you more awareness? Are you asking them to get you sales on certain products? So if e either one of those, you need to think about how you want to measure at the end, right? So for instance, you can perhaps give them affiliate links that they can track back to. They can measure how many sales that they actually made if they sell the product. Or potentially you can get them to use a certain hashtag, a certain type of account where they can direct visitors to, to actually follow and engage in the back of what they've done. So again, just to summarize again, this is the four steps that you need to take when it comes to doing an influencer marketing campaign. And the way I did this wheel is because a lot of times when you do one, the next one will be sometimes very, very much different to the previous one that you have done. So it's important to actually think about your goals um, over again and actually align with the other influencers that might be more relevant to the next campaign or potentially to your next brand. So when it comes to marketing communication, I like to think of it the other way nowadays. Um, instead of marketing your communication, now think about how you can create content that is really relevant, useful, engaging, and educational perhaps and then use that as a way to align with your product and brand to get it out there. So instead of marketing communication, think of communication and marketing. So next steps. Um, for some of you guys who might be interested in learning more about the other areas of Instagram, for instance, I'm doing a workshop um, coming up at the end of March. So it's called Instagram Made Easy for Business. And I'll be running through some of the influencer aspects as well as how to actually really engage with your audience through creating engaging posts, using the right filters, editing it correctly, and um, posting as well as using hashtag tricks that you can use to reach out to more people. Um, if you want, you can book yourself on at instagraminfluence.eventbrite.co.uk. And it's on the 29th of March, so it'll be literally the day after Easter, a good time to start thinking about cleaning up your social media tactics and maybe um, refreshing that this spring. So it's in the evening in central London. I'll reveal the location for those that booked, of course.